Hi everyone, welcome to another lecture and I promise I'm going to do my best to speak a little more slowly. Uh, so today this is an opening lecture that's just going to be a quick review of um, cardiac AMP and the reason we're doing that is because to understand that whole process of cardiac monitoring, what it shows us and how we respond to what we find, we need to just refresh our memory and have some insight into what that, um, uh, how our heart works, and in particular, the anatomy and the physiology and the processes in place. So bear with me and on we go. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna start again with an understanding of what the heart looks like and where it, the heart is positioned. So when we talk about the base or the posterior surface of the heart, and that's formed by the left atrium. So if you think the left atrium, the top of the left, the top left portion of the heart, and a small portion of the right atrium, uh, and the proximal portions of the superior and inferior vena cava, and as well as the pulmonary veins. And so that's what we call is the base, and that's the posterior surface of our heart. And keeping in mind, remember the adult heart is about the size of a fist. So it's about the size of the fist of the owner of that heart, a child or an adult. So roughly we're looking at about five inches or 12 centimeters long uh, and three and a half inches or nine centimeters wide. Uh, in terms of thickness, it's about two and a half inches or six centimeters thick. Okay, and just a picture here, uh, for you here of what the base of the heart is looking like. You see the arch of the aorta at the top of your picture, the uh, superior and inferior vena cava at the top and the bottom, and that um, the right pulmonary veins over there on the right-hand side of your picture, um, you see some of the left atrium and some of the right atrium, a large portion of the right atrium is there. That's the posterior part of your um, posterior surface, and we call that the base of your heart. Okay, now let's look at the anterior surface um, of your heart. And the anterior surface or the front of your heart, that's towards the outer side, right? It's that uh, surface of the heart that lies right beneath our sternum um, and the costal cartil cartilage that's right beside it. Um, and it's formed by portions of the right atrium um, and the left and right ventricles. So do you remember the posterior surface was mostly um, the, the left atrium. The anterior surface is some of the right atrium and also the left and the right ventricles. Uh, but remember the heart is sort of tilted, right? It's sort of tilted to the left in your chest. And so the right ventricle is the area of the heart that lies most directly behind the sternum. And the heart's apex or the lower portion is formed by the tip of the left ventricle. So the apex of the heart lies just above your diaphragm. And that's why when we have cardiac problems, there can be a real um, implication for our diaphragm and also an association with our breathing. Um, and it's at approximately the level of that fifth intercostal space. So we're looking, we're thinking mid-clavicular line, that fifth intercostal space. And here's a picture again. So you see, we're looking from the front of your heart. And when we're looking from the front of your heart, we see again your superior and, uh, vena cava, the inferior vena cava at the bottom. We've got the, the arch of our aorta right at the top of that picture. And we see that very large left ventricle. Remember the left ventricle is like the, the workhorse of your heart in terms of pumping. Uh, we see that, um, uh, we see some of the right ventricle there as well. And we have, um, uh, we have a good picture here that show us some of those really important um, coronary arteries. Okay, so let's talk about the surfaces of the heart. And this is really important because that, again, we're, when we're talking about blood um, perfusion and that our oxygen perfusion through our blood flow, it's important to understand the surfaces of the heart and how they work and the different kinds of conditions we'll talk about over the next couple of weeks that impact uh, blood flow and that the ability of the blood to pump. So the left lateral surface of the heart, remember left lateral surface of the heart faces the left lung and that's made, made, made up mostly of that left ventricle. And the right lateral surface faces the right lung, and that consists mostly of the right atrium. Remember that the heart is, is um, tilted a bit. So the right lateral surface that's toward our right lung is mostly that right atrium. And the left lateral surface that's toward our left 
lung is made up mostly of that big pump of the left ventricle. Okay, and now the layers of the heart. Again, really important. So there's three layers in our heart. Let's start with the pericardium. And the pericardium is really important. That's, think of it as sort of a two wall, a double walled sac, and it encloses the heart. And it really is important because the pericardium helps to protect your heart from trauma and from infection. And we have really serious consequences when there's an infection of that organ and we end up with a, an inflammatory process. I think many of you have heard of pericarditis. So this, it's a really tough outer layer uh, and, it's, and, uh, and there's a pericardial sac around that and it's called a fibrous parietal pericardium. And so that anchors the heart to some of the structures around it. So it keeps the heart in place and it really uh, most importantly anchors it to the sternum and the diaphragm. And we use ligaments to create that anchoring process. And that prevent, prevents our heart from moving around all over the place in our chest. The inner layer of this sac is called the serous pericardium, and that consists actually of two sublayers. There's a parietal layer and a visceral layer. The parietal layer lines the inside of the fibrous pericardium, and the visceral layer, which we also call the epicardium, adheres to the outside of the heart, and that forms the outer layer of the heart muscle. And so it's really important to keep in mind, we've got these three layers, the pericardium, the myocardium, which is that inside thick muscular layer. And the myocardium is, re is really, when you think of myo, it refers to muscle. So that it's responsible for the pumping action and the epicardium, which is uh, also called that sort of, it has that uh, visceral layer, is that external layer of the heart. It has uh, blood capillaries, lymph capillaries, nerve fibers, and some uh, fatty tissue. Okay, and now we know the heart um, is made up of um, chambers. So we've got the two upper chambers, which are the right and left atria, and the two lower chambers, the right and left ventricles. And they are going to work in concert with each other, and we'll talk about the role of each of those in the cardiac cycle and the cardiac uh, and, the, and the influence they have on cardiac output. Um, it's really important to understand the differences only because when we have an MI, when we're looking at a 12 lead ECG, and when we're looking at damage to different parts of our heart, we're going to be able to determine the effect that that has. Also, when we look at rhythms and we look at um, where a rhythm is affecting the um, contractility in our heart. So, for example, if an aberrant rhythm is affecting the contractility of the atrium, then we know that it has an impact on something called atrial kick, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So that's part of our um, cardiac output. Uh, it forms part of our cardiac output. And so recognizing how that heart is divided into chambers, how those chambers work in concert, is really important because ultimately that tells us about how the heart is functioning, what part of the heart may be disadvantaged or debilitated by something that's going on either in an electrical process, so by our um, rhythm interpretation, or if that rhythm interpretation is a sign of underlying cardiac damage. So if you recognize that, for example, an MI is happening and what part, portion of the heart is influenced by that. Okay, so we've got those four different chambers, the two upper uh, atria, the two lower ventricles, and then we all, and between all of these different areas, there are heart valves. So four valves in the heart, uh, there's two sets of what are called AV valves or atrioventricular valves and two sets of what are called semilunar or SL valves. And the purpose of these valves is to make sure, singular purpose, make sure blood does not flow back through the, uh, into, the, uh, into the previous chamber. So when blood flows from an atrium to a ventricle, there's great pressure as that ventricle is then contracting and trying to um, eject that blood. The pressure is enough that if, there, if those valves had not closed, instead of the blood going out either to our pulmonary circulation or to our generalized body circulation, it could easily backflow into the atria. And that's really important that we have a mechanism. Remember, our body has all this redundancy, that opportunity for it to prevent that. And so we make sure that by closing these valves instantly, as soon as that blood is ejected from the atria into the ventricles, as soon as that contraction starts within the ventricles, that the blood is not able to backflow into the atria. Okay, so let's talk just for a second about those AV or atrioventricular valves. 
So again, we're going to talk about uh, blood flow for a second. We've got AV valves, and those separate the atria from the ventricles. That's so simple, right? AV, atria from ventricles. So the flow of blood from the superior and inferior vena cava moves into the atria, and that's normally continuous. So blood doesn't come just all in one gush, but it's continuously flowing in. And about 70% of that blood flows directly from the atria into the ventricles. So it's not that the blood all collects in the atria and then when it's ready, the atria push it into the ventricles. There's a passive filling as it moves into the atria, it then continuously moves right into the ventricle. So about 70% of the flow of blood from the atria to the ventricles is this passive movement. It just continues to fill. But at the same time, as the atria fill with blood, the pressure within that little atria, the atria, um, builds. And it builds to such a point that the tricuspid and mitral valves open up. So tricuspid valve opens, mitral valve opens. And then when the atria contract, the atria get very, uh, completely filled, there's enough force that it, it, it causes a contraction. And you have an additional up, up to about 30% of blood flow into the ventricles because of this atrial contraction. And this is called our atrial kick. So when we have um, aberrant cardiac, um, um, consequences. So for example, in atrial fibrillation, where we have fibrillation that's happening up our atria instead of a good strong contraction, the atria is just like jiggling. What we lose is that cardiac uh, output associated with this atrial kick. So we, have, we continue to have that 70% of blood that flows right through the atria into the ventricle. So we have a sufficient cardiac output typically because 70% of that blood flow that goes into the ventricle just goes right through the atria to the ventricle. What we lose is anywhere from 10 to fully 30% of our cardiac output from that atrial kick, from that having that good, strong atrial contraction. And that's why it's really important that we, even though somebody might maintain an adequate cardiac output, in a condition that's affecting the atria, even though they are not the big pump of our heart, uh, we lose up to 30% of our cardiac output by disabling the atria. So that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, so now on the right side of the heart, blood, uh, the blood that's low in oxygen, remember we're looking at the right side now, blood that's low in oxygen goes into the right ventricle, and on the left side of the heart we have freshly oxygenated blood that empties into the ventricle and it's coming back from our lungs. So when the ventricles then contract, remember that's called systole, the ventricles are contracting, the pressure within the ventricles rises, and it's the tricuspid and it's the mitral valve that close when that uh, pressure within the ventricle exceeds that in the atrium. So it's important to keep in mind that we've got um, those tricuspid, the tricuspid valve involved and the mitral valve involved. And we start at the beginning of this whole process with those AV valves, so the um, atrial ventricle. And we're carrying on. Um, so the atrial ventricular valve um, are made up of chordae tendinae, and those are thin strands of connective tissue. On one end, they're attached to the underside of those AV valves, and on the other end, they're attached to small bits of myocardium that are called papillary muscles. So we have them attached to myocardium uh, called papillary muscles and, and to the AV valves. And the papillary muscles move inward from the lower portion of the ventricular wall. So they're sort of formed out of the uh, ventricular walls. When the ventricles uh, contract and relax, so do the papillary muscles. And so the papillary muscles adjust the tension on those chordae tendinae, and they prevent them from bulging too far into the atrium. So for example, um, when the right ventricle contracts, the papillary muscles of the right ventricle pull on the chordae tendinae chordae tendinae stretch, and that prevents the flaps of the tricuspid valve from bulging too far into the right atrium. And so as a result, the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles are like anchors. They serve sort of as anchors. And because the chordae tendinae are thin and they're sort of like string, uh, we sometimes call them heartstrings. And it's interesting because we use that expression of pulling on the heartstrings. Okay, now 
onto our semilunar valves. So when we're talking about our semilunar valves, we're talking about our pulmonic and our, our aortic valves. The semilunar valves prevent backflow of blood from the aorta and the pulmonary arteries into the ventricle. The semilunar valves have three cusps and they're sort of shaped like half moons and that's why we call them semilunar, they look like half moons. Uh, the openings of the semilunar valves are smaller than the openings of the AV valve and the flaps of the semilunar valves are smaller and thicker than the AV valves. So unlike the AV valves, the semilunar valves are not attached to any chordae, to the chordae tendinae and in fact they are a somewhat, uh, they have a somewhat um, less um, traumatic process in terms of the, the, the blood flow that moves through. Okay, so coronary circulation, I'm not really going to uh, belabor this, we'll show some pictures and that'll be helpful as we move through uh, the different um, kinds of interpretation, but keeping in mind we've got the uh, coronary arteries, uh, major coronary arteries are separated to the right and the left, and the left coronary artery is subdivided into the left anterior descending and the circumflex. When we're looking at coronary veins, in particular, we look at the coronary sinus. Uh, and let's just talk for a second about the autonomic nervous system. This is really important, again, when we're talking about um, innervation of the heart and what causes the heart to beat and how it responds to various um, uh, types of stimulation. The sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system it mobilizes your body. If you remember, that's associated with that fight or flight. So it allows your body to function under stress. The parasympathetic division is responsible for sort of convert, con um, conservation and restoring body resources. So we can't be in constant fight or flight. We can't be in constant response to stress. We need that um, associated period of recovery. And so we often call this uh, resting and digesting. So fight or flight is when we're revved up and then we need to come, come back down from that in order for our body to um, have a period of recovery and we call that, and that's the parasympathetic innervation um, activation and we call that rest and digest. Okay, three effects that are really critical in understanding how our heart how our heart works and in particular how um, uh, medications or other conditions can affect um, the car our cardiac output. So the first is what's called a chronotropic effect and I bet you've learned all about this in pharmacology. So that refers to something that causes a change in heart rate and a positive chronotropic effect refers to something that has, ha has increased the heart rate. A negative chronotropic effect refers to a decrease in the heart rate. So remember chronotropic refers to a change in the rate. Positive is increase, negative is a decrease. An inotropic effect, and this is really, you're gonna hear a, a lot about a large category of drugs called inotropes. So an inotropic of, a, effect refers to the actual contractility. So the, the, the contractility of the heart. And again, so a positive inotropic effect results in an increase in myocardial contractivity. So if we're giving a medication that causes a positive uh, inotropic effect, it increases that contractility of the heart. Why would we want to increase the contractility? Let's say the heart is not a, a very effective um, uh, pump. Remember last week we talked about cardiogenic shock where the heart is not able to pump adequately. It, the, yeah, there's an actual effect on the, the, the engine or the, the, yeah, the engine, the pump of the heart. So when we give a, a drug that has a positive um, inotropic effect, it increases that uh, contractility. A negative inotropic effect results in a decrease in that myocardial contractility. Uh, and then finally, there's a dromotropic effect. And that refers to the speed of conduction, in particular through the AV junction. And when we talk more about conduction, you're going to see that conduction starts way up there in, this, in the SA node hopefully in the SA node, sometimes it starts aberrantly in other places in the atria, but typically we're gonna see it starting in the SA node, it moves through the atria, there's a conduction pathway, it'll move through the atria, and it sort of stops in for a moment and gathers itself up at that AV junction. And so a dromotropic effect particularly has effect at that AV junction, the ability where, that, where you have that stopping and gathering up to speed that process up, so a or to slow it down. So a positive dromotropic effect 
is an increase in that AV conduction velocity, how quickly that conduction moves from its onset at the beginning of that tract and moves all the way down. A negative dromotropic effect results in a decrease in AV conduction velocity. So that AV conduction from the beginning along your conduction pathway to the end and, and ultimately that process um, leads to con contraction of the heart muscle. Um, a negative dromotropic effect is when we slow that down. Okay. Oh my gosh, cardiac cycle. How exciting. Cardiac cycle is um, something that, you remember again, we talk in this course, uh, what do you need to commit to memory, what you don't. You need to have a really clear understanding of the cardiac cycle because that's going to give you some understanding of where um, aberrant um, cardiac conduction is affecting the heart and how it may be affecting cardiac output. And all of this that we're studying ultimately tells us about cardiac output and how we can um, best facilitate a person have the best possible cardiac output given the circumstances that they're experiencing. So just as a reminder, systole is the period when the chamber is contra contracting and blood is being injected. So systole for the atria, the atria is going to contract and it's going to eject the blood into the ventricle. Systole for the ventricle is when the heart, is, the ventricle is contracting and that's going to eject the blood into the um, either into the circulation into into either the pulmonary circulation from or it's going to start or into the um, uh, general body circulation diastole is a really important phase so you think oh how is diastole so important that's relaxation it's when the heart is not contracting diastole so systole contraction diastole is relaxation diastole in the heart is really important because that is the only period where the heart actually heats up the heart is in service of the body. The heart works endlessly in service of the body. The only time it actually gets any blood flow to itself, not, we're not talking about blood flow to the rest of the body. This is where cardiac cellular circulation, that blood is, um, that flows into those cardiac cells to nourish them and maintain them. Those are cells that are constantly at work. Those are muscle cells that are constantly at work. They need to be nourished. They need to be oxygenated. The only time that happens is in that period of diastole when the heart's at rest. When it is contracting, there is no blood flow that's moving in, in into in, through that um, cardiac the, the cardiac muscle itself. And so it's that period of diastole is really important. Now, why would we think about that? Imagine somebody who's in a very fast rhythm. So imagine somebody who's in a supraventricular tachycardia, an atrial tachycardia, other kinds of rhythms that um, affect the speed at which the heart is contracting. If the heart is contracting very, very fast, instead of let's say our normal rate of uh, 60 to 100, or now we're starting to think 50 to 90, let's say someone has a heart rate of 120 or 130, even 140. What does that tell us? Immediately our head goes to think they have a shorter period of diastole, shorter period of relaxation when those chambers are filling. Not only do I have less opportunity for good cardiac output because internally the chambers are not filling adequately in that period of time, right? So there's not as much time for blood to flow in. That impacts how much blood I have flowing out. So we're talking about that, that whole circulatory system. But the heart itself has less opportunity for perfusion because that diastole is so short. And so what's one of the very first things we would be thinking when somebody is in a tacky rhythm? immediately moving to supplemental oxygen. We want to support that heart itself so that there is minima, uh, minimization of damage. And so understanding again that cycle and the systole, which is the contraction, and the diastole, which is the filling, and how they work together. Sometimes when we have cardiac issues, it's because the heart is not able to contract sufficiently and eject that blood sufficiently. Sometimes uh, uh, it, it, an interruption of the cardiac cycle or issues with cardiac output are related to that filling time. So we don't have adequate blood and uh, blood to eject because there's not been enough filling time, or we don't have enough time for that perfusion of the cardiac muscle itself to feed that cardiac muscle itself with oxygen. And so as a result, there's a real risk for damage to that cardiac muscle. Okay, so let's go through this because I've just made the big case of how important that is. Let's go through this just quickly together. So let's start with atrial diastole. During atrial diastole, blood from the superior and the inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus enter the right atrium. So blood is all dumping into the right atrium. 
right atrium fills up and it distends. And this pushes, remember we talked about valves before, it pushes the tricuspid valve open and the right ventricle fills up. And the same sequence occurs a split second earlier in the left side of the heart. So the left atrium receives blood from the four pulmonary veins, two from the right lung and two from the left lung. And the flaps of the mitral valve open as the left atrium. And so this allows blood to flow into the left ventricle. And so remember, we talked about this before, the ventricles are about 70% filled before the atria even contract. Contraction of the atria forces the additional blood, and that's about 10 to 30% of the ventricular capacity, into the ventricles. And do you remember what we called that? Atrial kick. So um, as a result, the ventricles become completely filled with blood during atrial systole. And then during uh, atrial systole, systole, blood doesn't flow into the atria because the pressure within the atria exceeds the venous pressure. So as the atria are contracting, no more blood is then flowing into them because there's increased pressure in the atria. As soon as they have emptied their blood flow into the ventricle, the pressure decreases and blood then begins to flow back into the atria. So they enter a period of uh, atrial diastole and that blood starts to flow and that's the beginning of the next part of the cycle. So let's talk about ventricular systole and diastole. Ventricular systole occurs as, ven as atrial diastole begins. So the, the atria start to relax, they open up and start to relax and begin to fill, and the ventricles are really just starting their work. As the ventricles contract, the blood is pushed through the systemic and the pulmonary circulation and towards the atrium. The semilunar valves close, and the heart then begins a period of ventricular diastole, so it's that relaxation. During ventricular diastole, the ventricles begin to passively fill with blood, and both the atria and ventricles are relaxed. So the cardiac cycle begins again with atrial systole and the completion of ventricular filling. And it's really important to recognize this is where we hear our love dub, and everybody knows the love dub is actually those valves. It's not the heart uh, contracting. There's no sound associated with that, but we hear the click click of the valves opening and closing. And I'm just going to show this on the next page. So again, that idea, blood is emptying into, passively emptying into the atria. Uh, the right is just a split second before the left. Um, and as, and in particular, we focus sort of on that, uh, on, on that process. And we see that um, passive movement of blood from the atria to the ventricles, about 70% of the blood that finds its way to the ventricles just moves passively from the atria to the ventricles. But as that pressure begins to build, we get to a point where there is a contraction uh, of the atria, and that accounts for about 30% of our cardiac output as that vinyl of blood is, is actively ejected into the ventricle. Uh, the atria then relax, the ventricle begins its work, um, and so as the atria relax, they start to slowly fill again. Now the valves between the atria and the ventricle are closed because the ventricle is in that period of um, systole and it's going to contract and eject blood to either a pulmonary circulation or generalized body circulation. Almost there, here's a picture. So I'm gonna let you follow your way through this whole process. But remember, uh, blood, I'm just gonna give you a minuscule overview. Blood from the inferior and superior vena cava empties into that right atrium. It can, it, as it, about 70% of the filling of that ventricle happens passively as it moves right through the atrium into the ventricle, the ventricle starts to fill. As the atria becomes more and more filled, when it gets to a, a, the, the muscle fibers become stretched, this stimulates contraction. The contraction account, um, uh, makes sure that the atria fully ejects what blood had, it, it's uh, filled with and that blood goes into the ventricles. The ventricles work to um, uh, um, eject blood that's either gonna go to generalized body circulation or pulmonary circulation. Okay, cardiac output. So it's really important that cardiac output, uh, that we understand cardiac output, and in particular this point, um, that cardiac output can be increased by an increase in heart rate or an increase in stroke volume. So keep, it, keep that in mind. Increase in heart rate 
So are we, our heart rate moves from 50 to 70, or our heart rate moves from 80 to 120. Um, sometimes it's, an, it's a compensatory important um, increase in heart rate that actually supports uh, cardiac output. And sometimes it is an aberrant increase in heart rate that actually decreases our cardiac output. So cardiac output in, in some situations can be increased by a change in our heart rate. It also can be affected by a change in our stroke volume. So that's the amount of blood that's ejected with each um, cardiac, with the, the, that cardiac cycle, the amount of blood that's ejected from that uh, ventricle. It's also important to keep in mind that increases in our heart rate shorten all phases of the cardiac cycle. We talked about that a little bit already. Um, and the most important uh, thing in, to keep in mind around this is that um, the time the heart spends re relaxing and being perfused itself is uh, decreased and the length of time for ventricular relaxation is shortened and so less time for the ventricles to fill. So two things, less time for the ventricles to fill, so you end up with less blood that moves into the ventricles and so our stroke volume, the amount of blood that we're injecting with each ventricular contraction is going to decrease because there's less filling time and also we talked about cardiac perfusion itself is impacted. Okay, here we go, wrapping up. And so because of that, we really want to watch for um, how to recognize signs of decreased cardiac output. And so here's just a summary to remind you. So with a decrease in cardiac output, we can see acute changes in blood pressure. And remember, we always say that is a late stage sign. We want to watch for early stages, uh, early um, stage signs. But sometimes uh, this can happen incredibly quickly and we may move to... Um, an acute change in blood pressure almost immediately, depending on the severity of the underlying cause. We can see acute changes in mental status. So decreased level of consciousness uh, can start with confusion, agitation, uh, sometimes that sense of impending doom, things like that. So acute, uh, acute changes in mental status. Often we're looking at someone's skin and because there's a change in uh, perfusion, we see that cool and clammy skin. We can see changes to the, someone's um, color of someone's skin and their mucous membranes. They can become dusky, pale skin, dusky around their um, mucous membranes. In their lungs, if there's, and so that's all around central um, circulation. But if we're thinking about um, pulmonary circulation, what are the signs of decreased cardiac output? We can start to hear that um, spacing of fluid, there's spa third spacing of fluid into the lungs where we, see, where we hear crackles. In the old days, people called them rawls. I don't think people called them rawls anymore, just crackles. Uh, dyspnea or shortness of breath, patients can become symptomatic with that. We start to see dys, uh, dysrhythmias and that's really important uh, to recognize as we uh, move into the process of ECG interpretation. We can see fatigue, real um, shortness of breath and fatigue go hand in hand and also um, that work of breathing when someone is using a lot of accessory muscles to breathe, we really see that uh, fatigue develop quite quickly. Orthopnea, and do you remember what orthopnea is? Orthopnea is where um, you, uh, typically a patient's gonna have difficulty with their breathing that's related to position. And often we have, um, we talk about how much, uh, how many pillows a person might have to uh, use to get themselves into a position where they can adequately breathe. If you remember when a person is short of breath, we typically put them into a higher um, elevation, uh, all things being equal. Again, we're measuring cardiac output through this process, but shortness of breath um, and orthopnea typically is going to be relieved uh, at some at, in the early stages by positioning and putting somebody head up while we uh, treat the underlying cause. And then finally, that restlessness. When somebody is short of breath, they're dyspneic, they're um, struggling with work of breathing, they can become very quickly restless and their, their um, oxygenation may be impacted. So again, we're, we're seeing that, those changes in mental status. Okay. This is the first, I, if we're still at the dry stage, this is the first underlying uh, background video. And the reason we did this is really to give you a sense of why these things matter, because ultimately when we look at ECG interpretation uh, and that electrical um, system, the electrical system is only important because it affects the mechanical system. So the electrical system uh, drives the mechanical system. We need the mechanical system to be able to work because ultimately what we need is cardiac output because cardiac output is how our body survives. That uh, pumps blood around, it brings nutrients and oxygen to the level of the cells in our whole body to target organs and right down to all of the tissues in our body. So understanding all that physiology is important because different kinds of um, 
implications for medications, for cardiac rhythms, and for underlying cell health tells us about how that heart is functioning and how that heart is functioning tells us about how the body and the human being will continue to survive. Okay, on to the next lecture. See you in class.